Hi everyone and welcome to the Think Tank for Women in Business and Technology. I'm Somi Aryan and I'm the founder of this movement where I host a conference series to explore the challenges that impact women's socioeconomic status and how technology can help us change this historical narrative. In our first conference for the Think Tank for Women in Business and Technology, I mentioned my hypothesis around the relationship between biology and environment and the self. I explained how information or data connects these elements. The core argument of this think tank and the movement that we have built over the past six months or so is that there is a tangible data gap when it comes to almost every aspect of socioeconomic progress in relation to women. At the most fundamental level, this data gap can even be seen in our understanding of female biology. Let me give you a few examples. Did you know that women face adverse reaction to drugs twice as often as men because drug dosages have historically been uh, based on clinical trials conducted on men? Female subjects have historically been excluded from toxicology and biomedical research. 52% of women have experienced period pain that affects their ability to work, but only 27% of them have ever told their employers about it. Women are historically underrepresented in cardiovascular research because they often have different symptoms than men. Because of this, women are less likely to survive a heart attack, particularly when they are treated by a male doctor. Here's another one. One in four women considers leaving work due to menopause. These are some staggering statistics and the list goes on. Now, what you are about to hear is the full edit of the third conference with the theme of femtech, which is a term used to refer to technologies that focus on female health. We also look at why women are underrepresented in certain areas of medical practice, such as surgery. For example, why we have very few female orthopedic surgeons. This is important because where there is a lack of women, there is a lack of data about women. What we are going to explore today is how we can address this. However, as you will hear from our first speaker, Dr. Mitzi Kokover, we cannot build successful businesses in the area of female health technology or femtech without considerable investment. Dr. Krakover is principal and senior consultant at SSB Solutions. She has over 20 years of experience with a focus on medicine, health, and women's health issues, and is a strong advocate for and an angel investor in the area of femtech where she advises and mentors female entrepreneurs to build innovative businesses. So from here on, we're going to dive right into the live recording of the conference. So Dr. Krukover, thank you for bravely opening the conversation here. As you could see, you know, as always, I always, when I start these conferences, I'm always for the first two minutes, I'm super, super nervous. And I'm sure that people forgive me for that. You know, it's like each of these conferences take about six weeks to put together. And we are doing this, you know, with a small team. And we've already got 10,000 people who have signed up to follow this. You know, one of the things that I've learned in life was that uh, it doesn't matter if it's not perfect, prolific over, uh, over perfect, that's my motto. So my question to you, Dr. Krukover, is can you tell us a little bit about what are some of the things that are holding women back in raising money, in raising investment, building businesses uh, around femtech, and why historically femtech has not been given uh, the respect maybe that it should have in terms of being able to build um, you know, products and services and businesses that will uh, address women's health issues. Sure, and first of all, Somi, I just wanna thank you. Um, first of all, for your passion around this area and for organizing this thought-provoking panel. Again, um, I know it takes a lot of work to do this and uh, the fact that you've done this as well as uh, gotten together these amazing people um, is so important to have these discussions. And so I'm very honored to be here. So thank you very much. Um, and I'm also honored to be with the two uh, of those female entrepreneurs that you're speaking of. And I'm looking forward to hearing about um, everyone else's comments. So as you noted, there's been a relative lack of investment funding for women's health companies. And I believe the reasons for that are at least threefold. There's a funding gap, a research gap, and a leadership gap. With respect to the funding gap, we know that women entrepreneurs are funded less often and at lower amounts than men. 
And you add to that that most women's health companies are founded by women. In, in fact, according to Rock Health, 80% of the femtech companies that raised capital last year were led by women. By now, we're all aware that the health research that you um, noted has focused mostly on the 70 kilogram white male. And it wasn't until the 1990s that the National Institutes of Health here in the United States mandated that studies must include women and other underrepresented people just in order to be funded by the National Institutes. And as we all know, there's been a dearth of research on specific women's health issues, such as endometriosis, menstruation, menopause, fibromyalgia. And as a former clinician, I can tell you that that lack of knowledge greatly impacts how we address women's issues. And then there's the leadership gap. Not only do we need more women in the decision-making roles at VC and other higher funding levels, we also need more women in science and in leadership roles in academia. Studies show that women scientists are less likely to apply for patents and therefore protect their discoveries. So obviously training is needed in this area. But here's good news. Even in this vacuum, there are women who've identified their own pain points, sometimes literally, and provided solutions for those issues that have been neglected by our health system, and they are making headway. In 2018, United States, in United States Femtech startups, they received a record-breaking $388 million compared to previous. Um, unfortunately, it represented only about 4% of the year's total funding, so lots of room for growth. And in 2019, Femtech received just short of $800 million in funding. And hopefully uh, 2020 will show us uh, gaining even more ground. And in fact, we still have a lot to do, but at least we're trending in the right direction. So to answer your second question, what can we do to change the narrative? I believe that as there are more exits and more successes, the market will respond. And we also need to get the word out that data shows that female founded companies deliver over twice as much per dollar invested than their male owned counterpart. counterpart. So it's a good business decision. Entrepreneurs need to paint a clear picture to their potential funders that they've reduced the investor's risk and have a high potential for success. And as an angel investor, I look for a number of key variables that the founder has found an actual pain point and a solution that a relatively large market is looking for. Not doing so is the number one reason companies fall, fail. We're looking for proof that someone is willing to pay for it through a pilot or a revenue stream and why it's better than the competition and that that uh, company has a moat such as IP as a barrier to other companies to entry and that there's a viable exit plan. At the end of the day, investors just want to make a return on their investment in the shortest time. We also need to develop more investment funds that focus on women's health and also focus on funding female founders and leaders. Scientists, especially women scientists, need to understand how to translate their research to the market and how to protect their work through patents. So, just to sum it up, I really do believe that as more successes accumulate, so will the funding, but that we really have to continue to be strategic, prepared, and focused. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was really helpful, uh, Mitzi, and I'm very much looking forward to working with you, um, you know, moving forward uh, more closely, because of one of my passions here is to try and bring um, uh, more people like yourself, but, but also I think there are so many people, so many women who could be investors and who could invest in these uh, technologies, um, but maybe they don't even know, like it, it feels like uh, um, something that's like not very achievable to them, or uh, maybe they don't know enough about it. So I really feel like we need to raise uh, awareness here. And I'm very interested to hear from our next speaker, um, Helen Gilliam, uh, Helen, let me bring you up here so you can tell me if I'm actually pronouncing your name correctly. So let me bring you up here. Okay. Uh, so Helen, am I, am I saying your name correctly? Helen Gilliam, right? It's, uh, yeah, in French it's Helen Guillaume, but how you said is perfect. Okay. Okay. So I will, I will make sure to practice that. So um, Helen, uh, you uh, have created um, a wild uh, AI. 
Um, so I will let you tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit about, uh, about yourself and uh, what were some of the challenges that you faced um, in terms of you know, bringing uh, investment to it, getting it up, uh, up and running, and what what is it exactly? What, what are you building? Yeah, thanks a lot. So um, my background, I studied mathematics and financial risk, and I was a quant in a hedge fund, and then management consultant to Fortune 500 companies. My big client was Fannie Mae in DC on optimizing internal risk models using AI, so very much on the data science side. And on parallel of that, I was doing sports, uh, so ultra marathons, triathlons, ice swimming, and been tracking data sets a lot, but basically realized that we understood very little our bodies, whereas we understood very well, like, how to take smart investment decisions in finance, or we understood cars, to so build wild AI originally for men and women, but then realized that for women, we understood very little and that actually no one really cared. So we've done extensive research on the female body and we created an app helping women train, fuel and recover based on the menstrual cycle or based on the symptoms if they are in perimenopause or menopause. So it's an app that women get on the line is the research and our team includes uh, the co-founder uh, of Clue, which is the company that originally invented the word femtech. So he's in our team, um, people like Dr. Stacy Sims, who's like world reference in female physiology, it's like top notch team. And that's the building block. And the first client of that research is our app. And we aim down the line to be able to serve all product services devices out there that are technology, but are actually men technology. If you call female technology, what we're doing in <laughs> bio position, everything that exists is men tech. So we want to be able to serve them. So when my O-ring tells me that my resting heart rate and, uh, goes up and my body temperature goes up, uh, it's actually normal because of where I am in my menstrual cycle and ovulation rather than um, that I'm getting sick, basically. So yeah, that's a big gender data gap because uh, all the, le the, the readings of the actual data that technology is reading today is actually based uh, on, on men for men. And I bring you uh, an anecdote from my own company. So we were in the team, two men, two women having a discussion, and we we're saying, what, what should we track as data to start with? And the women were saying, we need to track sex drive because, and the, then the men were saying, we, it's and on data, we don't need to track it. It doesn't really change. And we we're saying, well, it changes all the time. And so if you are inside of a company and you have a majority of men or only men, like you can imagine like the developing room of Apple, um, it's very hard to create companies that are actually serving properly women. So that's really all in technology, uh, a massive gap. And like medic in, 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 med in medicine, like you have health and female health sports, female sports, and technology and female technology. So there's this huge gap that needs to be tackled now and served now. So that's that's what we are aiming, and we're aiming to serve a billion women by 2030 through technology, serving through an API, other technologies. And to your question, uh, what kind of challenges? Um, I think uh, just the credibility often. It's um, like men still perceive female technology as uh, a niche or even even women like we all biased and even more we, we started with sports so like women in sports sounds very uh, antagonist for a lot of people and we serve women of all ages excluding pregnant women but including women in, in menopause and then they would say well that's even more niche and I'm like well your wife is probably in perimenopause and menopause and you have no idea and uh, so people have really like they have no understanding they they often have no knowledge and no interest in understanding so i think now it's the time to change that and that everyone is interested ask question and and we need men and women to be interested in that so yeah that's us in nutshell our next guest is rick rowan uh, helen thank you so much again so rick um, all right, let me uh, tell you a, a, a word here, uh, you know, of uh, disclaimer. So, uh, w first of all, when I created this uh, movement, a lot of people were coming to me and saying, oh, so now you're creating this um, movement around, around women. So does it mean that you're not going to support, um, say, people who are non-binary or men, you know, who are building businesses around uh, female 
health. And the truth is that that's absolutely not true. So we will ask Yona, our guest, um, in the second half. Um, but our next guest is Rick Rowan, who is the CEO and um, founder of NeuroCore Bioelectronic. I discovered this company when I had a hernia surgery and I used their um, uh, their device with uh, to help me with pain management. And it, it became a question for me whether uh, their uh, technology could help women with period pain. Um, so I will let Rick explain that to you. Um, but disclaimer part is the fact that I actually uh, invested in um, NeuroCore myself as well. So there you go. I do support. So Rick, it's your turn. Thanks, Sammy. Uh, we're an evidence-led bioelectronics life sciences company. We develop wait, wait, wait. programmable electroceutical software protocols that go into therapeutic applications that go into wearables. One of our subsidiary spin-outs is a femtech startup focusing on female-specific health solutions. Uh, we have the potential through smart use of technology to positively impact female health challenges, challenges that are not being adequately considered uh, in regards to effects on quality of life as well as the workplace. One of those challenges is period pain. Despite the high prevalence of uh, dysmenorrhea or period pain is often poorly treated, even disregarded by health professionals, pain researchers, and the women themselves who may unwittingly just accept it as a normal part of their cycle. On average in Western societies, period pain affects around 80% of women. Uh, some statistics show that USA, as an example, 85% or 42 million females suffer painful menstrual symptoms, 25% of adults and as high as 90% of adolescents, three and a half million unable to function for two days of each month, annual losses estimated at 600 million work hours or 2 billion US dollars lost in productivity. Over 90% of UK companies have no period pain policy. As Somi mentioned in her opening remarks, 52% of Women have experienced period pain that has affected their ability to work, but only around a quarter of that 52% um, have actually told their employers about it. So bioelectronic technology or bioelectrical technology offers women around the world an affordable, on-demand, non-pharmacological method of managing period pain with what we call ultra wearables. These can fit seamlessly into lifestyle, ease of use and physical needs. It meets a universal need for women to have control and effective management of period pain. The technology aims to empower women, stimulate social change and improve quality of life, which as mentioned includes the workplace. This is a significant opportunity for the latest advances in med tech innovation and non-drug pain management as a solution. Other health areas that electroceuticals or electroceutical technology can help are pelvic floor, uh, incontinence, commonly exhibited post-childbirth, and more specific conditions that was mentioned earlier, like endometriosis. The R&D in this area is led by two amazing women from our team, a cell biologist with microcurrent expertise and a doctor with 15 years experience treating pain and wounds with bioelectrical therapies. It's our hope that we will also see female-led investments support the technology and the market opportunities for positive change. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rick. And of course, you know, as you know, I've worked very hard to try and bring in more women, um, you know, invest in and take interest in um, uh, bioelectronics. It's been definitely an eye opener for me. Um, so uh, we have talked about, um, uh, Rick, if you could please mute yourself. Um, so we are going to have next, uh, yes, okay. So um, we have talked about female pain. Now our next speaker also deals with pain, but of a different kind. Dr. Bhattacharya is the president of orthopedics at Royal Society of Medicine. And he's also clinical di uh, director of orthopedics at Imperial College Hospital. He's also an active entrepreneur. Uh, he's got a keen interest in digital technologies and how they can improve our approach to human health. Dr. Bhattacharya, now I know that um, you need to leave us. Um, I, I understand you had another engagement. So thanks for your patience as I was dealing with all these different te technical issues. So um, uh, it, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that we don't have enough female surgeons 
um, be it in orthopedics or other areas. Can you tell us why this may be the case and how the lack of equality of female presence at, the, at that level uh, is possibly affecting some women um, adversely? And uh, finally, also, um, is there any way that you think technology could help us close the gap when it comes to training and supporting more female surgeons in medical fields? Thank you, Somi. Uh, firstly, for the kind introduction and for inviting me to this fantastic forum. You are absolutely right in that there is a significant gender imbalance in surgical specialties, tilted much more favorably towards men, more so in orthopedics, both in the UK and abroad. In fact, there was a recent article published in the Journal of Orthopedics and Trauma exploring this disparity by a group of international female orthopedic surgeons who have developed the International Orthopedic Diversity Alliance. To put this imbalance into some numerical context, although females represent more than 50% of medic medical graduates in most nations, including the UK, females still often constitute less than 10% of orthopedic surgeons, and orthopedics remains the least gender diverse of all surgical specialties. The proportion of female orthopedic surgeons ranges from a reasonable 26% in places like Estonia and Sweden to 0% in places like Cambodia, uh, with the UK faring quite poorly actually at 4.8%. In fact, I read a recent posting on Twitter that at our current rate, it would take us 138 years to reach a stage where 50% of orthopedic surgeons in the UK become women. I'm not sure of the validity of the statement, but these are quite telling numbers. Even in other surgical specialties that have a relatively high proportion of women, example plastics, it is still estimated that at the current rate, it would take about seven years for women to equal the number of men in that specialty. There are a few reasons for it. The competence of females is never in question, as studies have demonstrated time and again that patients of female surgeons actually have fewer complications and lower mortality. And neither do patients show any particular preference for male orthopedic surgeons. But there are some barriers that exist to increasing the number of females in, in orthopedics. Most people know of the famous quote of the ex-CEO of PepsiCo, Inda Nui, where she stated that for a woman, the biological clock and career clock are in total conflict with each other. Surgery is an apprenticeship, and unfortunately, apprenticeship does not do very well with interruption, as you lose muscle memory as well as the knowledge and skills. This is probably a reason why that puts women off from considering surgery as a career choice. There's also a whole range of unconscious bias, which dissuades women from applying to do orthopedics and prevents men from appointing them. There is also the self-perpetuating cycle of lack of women as role models and in leadership positions in the surgical and orthopedic world, which therefore fails to attract the next generation of women. There is the widely held belief in orthopedic surgery that it requires a lot of muscle strength, which, although not completely irrational, is probably not the whole story. It's more about technique than strength, although I do accept that occasionally you do require physical strength, particularly when you're going through an entire orthopedic training rotation where there will be a posts where you have to use a degree of physical strength like when doing hip and knee replacements. So these things tend to put women off. Um, traditionally, there used to be an environment of chauvinism within the orthopedic circle, although thankfully this is eroding rapidly with the newer generation of men who do not feel the need to prove their superiority through boorish and bigoted behavior. And so some of these barriers, while they require behavioral and policy change, taking steps to actively encourage women into the specialty, Thankfully, we have got technology that is starting to provide us several other ways of dealing with at least one of the key barriers, that is that anxiety of interruption of apprenticeship due to the biological clock. We are now seeing increasing use of technology and digital platform for the training of future surgeons. These include cognitive task analysis, virtual simulation, both web-based and lab-based, haptics, optical devices like HoloLens, I've personally undertaken a lot of work in this regard and I've published in this a fair bit as well. These simulations are often performed away from the patients. And as a result of the current technology, these tools can often be accessed from home. Therefore, the traditional situation where the female trainee had to take time off work to raise family and thus lose all touch with the surgical world can hopefully be mitigated through the use of these technological tools at our disposal. At the end of the day, given that this is still a male-dominated environment, it requires a fundamental change in the attitude of men and increasing visibility of females in and role model positions that is likely to provide the continued push for balancing out the gender disparity. Hope that answers most of your questions. Thank you so much, Raj. That was very, very helpful. Every time I listen to one of you guys, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 
uh, understanding new things so, uh, that uh, you know, maybe wasn't um, talked about before. So uh, that really explains a lot why we don't have more surgeons because of the apprenticeship nature of um, of surgery and it, it sort of makes complete sense. So next we have Marion Stewart, who uh, has been a supporter of this movement from very early on. Um, I remember uh, your face, Marion, popping up in my uh, LinkedIn, you know, very early on, and and uh, I appreciate your support all this time. Um, so uh, Marion, uh, you work on. I know that you have a very interesting work that you're doing with like Daily Mail, writing articles and and trying to raise awareness. Uh, about um, the different ways that people can use natural ways of um, dealing with uh, PMS and, and menopause and things like that. So I will let you explain a little bit yourself about what it is that you're doing, the work that you're doing, and take it from there and, and maybe talk about how technology can help um, amplify the, and, uh, the work that you're doing. Yes, and thank you very much, Simi, for inviting me today to share my passion. Uh, as you rightly say, I've been around in this area for a long time, helping women with PMS and menopause, and everything we do is natural and based on published medical research, which and it's effective as well, so that 94% of women, for example, who followed my PMS program were symptom-free, and 91% of those who followed the five-month menopause program were too. And so when I see people suffering, it makes me really angry at the injustice, especially as women have been competing in the workplace with men for so long and when they get to midlife, it's not fair that they fall over. And at the beginning, you alluded to the fact that women are leaving the workplace and you're right. Women in their 40s and 50s are the fastest growing sector in the workplace, yet despite that, millions are leaving because they don't feel that they can be productive anymore. And we know that a combination of published research and AI can help them to be the best version of themselves. And we give them what we call a midlife refuel so that they can get turbocharged and come out the other end feeling really well and very productive. Now, last year, Forbes said that it's costing $810 billion a year globally because of lost productivity and efficiency. So it's really, really hitting the economy. And we also know that by the year 2025, there'll be 1 billion women experiencing menopause. And from our surveys of thousands of women, we know not only are they leaving the workplace, but in the last survey we did on 1,100 women, 96% of them said that they were actually unprepared for menopause, and two-thirds of them said it was robbing them of their life as they knew it, which is obviously not right. But when you look at surveys like the Mayo Clinic survey that was published last year on doctors and gynecologists, and only 7% of them admitted that they had adequate education to help women going through menopause, then you can understand why women are suffering in the way they are. Now, as I said, I've been helping women for 28 years to overcome menopause and everything we do is natural. And I was helping people on a one-to-one, -one, but three years ago, I made four little films on my phone for Facebook Live. And within 12 weeks, over a million women saw those films. And I was completely inundated with suffering, needless suffering, and it made me feel upset and angry. So my team and I got organized. We took the research from my five month program and we put together a six week program with bite sized chunks of information so that we could teach women how to use it and make their lives much better. What we didn't realize at that point was that even in six weeks, we will be turning their lives around and that they would be getting rid of things like brain fog and anxiety and they'd be sleeping at night and their thermometer will be back in their control. And so Fast forward a few years, we've now got a tech enabled program, which you can run from your phone or any other device. And you can track your symptoms, you can actually get your course materials, your personalized program and attend live ses sessions. And then the next phase of our tech is that we're in the process at the beginning of the journey of creating a neural network where we're bringing together all the real time research and information about the women, their medical history, their symptoms and their diet and lifestyle and so on. And we're creating algorithms and AI so that eventually we will be able to scale to reach millions of women simultaneously with personalized programs that they can use. And we also aim to take the stigma out of menopause so that people come to realize that all they need is a midlife refuel. They just need to get their nutrients into an optimum range 
and to top up on naturally occurring hormones which mother nature provides us we believe that every single woman in the world has a right to this information we're focusing on the workplace at the moment because the information is not coming from doctors so we partner with virgin care and other companies and we're delivering this in the workplace so that we can demonstrate the difference that we're making how we're reducing symptom scores and increasing productivity so that the women feel better and also they are better in their family as well as in the workplace and we're just looking for all the wisdom and support we can get to help us with this massive global mission that occupies my every waking hour. Thank you so much, Marianne. I'm, I'm really hoping that we will be able to uh, provide this, uh, the support that you're, you're looking for. You know, so far we've got over 10,000 women who have um, signed up and, and expressed interest in supporting this movement. So um, definitely we will do everything we can to uh, get the word out. And, and I definitely am interested in your program because I'm a sufferer. So um, definitely going to check it out and look at your recommendations. And I hope that we can aggregate all of this data and, and have a more technological approach to it. Next, we have uh, Dr. Um, Min Cheng, Professor Min Cheng, uh, who uh, is a professor at Florida University, and she has received the Best Professor and uh, Best Course Awards from FIU's Healthcare MBA program. Her research examines information technology innovations in healthcare analytics and regulation uh, around female um, healthcare. She's going to share her observation with us around how handling of data related to maternal and birth outcomes impacts women's experience. This is like, it, it just blew my mind when I, when I heard it during the rehearsal. So I'm uh, going to let her explain this to you herself. Thanks, Somi, for the introduction. And I'm very excited to be part of this amazing conference and have the opportunity to share my research with all of you. Um, my research was motivated by both the rising U.S. maternal mortality rate and the global C-section epidemic. There's a nearly 30% increase in maternal death rate in the last 20 years. And women are increasingly dying or suffering from complications unnecessarily in childbirth. How can we stop it? Also, over the last two decades, the global C-section rate has almost doubled and reached alarming epidemic levels, especially in developed countries. WHO recommends a population C-section rate around 10 to 15%. However, in the US nowadays, every one in three babies are born by C-section. In South Florida, where I live, the average C-section rate is actually over 60%, and in some hospitals, it's even close to 100%. Um, although C-section rates, um, C-sections can be life-saving for certain high-risk pregnancies, compared to vaginal birth, it's still a major surgery, and the procedures carry significantly higher risks of dangerous complications. Uh, and lead to, you know, not very desirable experiences for women. Many of the C-sections performed on the low risk cases are, are, are actually unnecessary and end up doing more damage than good. Um, C-sections also cost at least 50% more than natural birth. So the million dollar question for patients, providers, and policymakers is this, how can we better match the procedures with the patients? So we can ensure that those high-risk mothers get the much-needed C-sections, while at the same time reducing the unnecessary C-section procedures for low-risk mothers. So to answer this question, my research team assembled some large-scale data sets covering the millions of childbirths occurred in the state of Florida over a six-year period. We compared the before and after changes across hospitals that used electronic health records to track and share the expectant mother's information versus those hospitals that do not. What we find is that um, the appropriate use of those technologies is associated with 25% drop in the likelihood of maternal complications, including third or fourth degree laceration and unplanned operating room procedures. We further find that in order to fully reap the benefits of health information technologies, it requires several important things. 
First, the adoption of electronic health records to collect detailed information during the whole pregnancy journey. The detailed information not only include test results and demographics, but also should include important social and behavioral factors. So these factors can be used to assess mother's risks and hence help providers to recognize risk early on from the prenatal period and take those um, preventive measures in time. And secondly, it requires an information sharing infrastructure, such as health information exchange, also called HIE, to connect data from multiple disparate EHR systems. HIE helps break down data silos and enables the hospital team to assess prenatal information collected from OBGYN offices so they can be prepared during childbirth. And finally, it requires the use of analytics to continuously monitor outcomes, increase accuracy of measurement, and update the grouping of patients into different risk levels so that uncertainty is further reduced. Um, we are continuing to push forward our research and next, we'd like to better understand how the use of specific EHR functionalities can affect cost and health outcomes. And our biggest challenge is actually data, you know, uh, high quality data. So I would like to ask the audience for help. If you are aware of granular data on providers' actual use of specific EHR functionalities or their access to health information, please do let me know. We also welcome your feedback and suggestions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, um, Professor Chen. That was very, uh, very interesting. And I really hope that uh, people do reach out to you. I wonder how what you discussed translate into UK's NHS. So if we have viewers, you know, listeners or people who are listening afterwards who have some insights regarding this um, in the UK, please do share it with us so that we can compare experiences. Our next guest um, uh, and the final guest for this part, so then we are going to go into Q&A and then we will have uh, our part two. Uh, her name is um, Courtney Williams. Uh, so she uh, is the co-founder of Imagine uh, Solutions um, Technology. She also works on the whole subject of pregnancy, which we just talked about, but in a different context. This, you know, this time we're talking about, it's, it's a bit of a sad thing to end uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, part of the conversation with, but I felt that it was so important. And that is the um, maternal mortality. And, and I can't even believe, like, when I listened to uh, Courtney during the rehearsals, um, you know, I was thinking, like, I, I used to think that maternal mortality belonged to uh, you know, at all ages, or I come originally from Iran, you know, I, I could see that um, you know, back home. But I felt like in, I thought that in the West uh, and in today's um, technological society, it was not so much uh, an issue, uh, but it seems that it is. And uh, Courtney has done some very interesting work on that, and she's going to share her insights with us. It's really nice to meet all of you and be here on the panel. Um, so yeah, um, you know, we, my name is Courtney Williams. I'm co-founder and CEO of Imagine Solutions Technology. Um, I founded my company because my sister actually had a very difficult pregnancy. And what keeps our team up at night is a statistic that many people have a very hard time accepting, um, that the U.S. is currently the most dangerous and expensive place in the developed world to give birth. Um, negative uh, maternal health outcomes disproportionately affect African-American, Indigenous women, and rural communities. Um, and these groups are dying at up to three times the rate of their white and Latina counterparts. Um, some of the most common conditions that can arise during pregnancy um, and contribute to maternal mortality can be decreased in severity with faster treatment and care. Um, for example, preeclampsia. Um, this affects one in 20 births in the U.S., or 150,000 women each year. Um, it can be a life-threatening condition that presents starting in the second trimester, and it can be experienced up to six weeks postpartum. Um, this condition and all of the others cost lives, and it's an expensive burden for the healthcare system as well. Um, just preeclampsia alone costs the U.S. healthcare system $2.18 billion per year to treat, um, and it costs three times more to treat a patient with this kind of condition um, because it's usually detected when symptoms are already life-threatening. 
So um, as it is, you know, women find that there's really no easy, clear way to communicate with their doctor here in the U.S. outside of regular prenatal visits. And the current state of prenatal care here really does not have the same modern tools as other medical specialties do. Um, and, you know, as it is today, you go to a series of maybe 10 to 12 prenatal visits, you get two ultrasounds during the course of your pregnancy, and your doctor typically, you know, pops on a fetal Doppler on your stomach to listen to the fetal heart rate. Um, but as you can imagine, with this, um, with this workflow, a lot can be missed, um, and complications can be worse when they're treated later. So um, we've invented a platform, the Imagine Solutions Pregnancy Care Platform, to address this. Um, the uh, patients first you know, start off by managing their symptoms as they happen, taking control of their health from positive pregnancy tests through postpartum checkup. Um, then our clinic software interface is serving as the second set of eyes for the doctor, where doctors get real-time information about their patient's symptoms and can see complications as they are starting to arise. Um, another important part of this solution is that the provider is also utilizing our FDA-cleared VistaScan handheld ultrasound in prenatal appointments to get better diagnostic information. So this ultrasound ties the solution together because our imaging tool has been specifically developed to do basic life-saving ultrasound checks that a simple fetal Doppler can't do. Um, again, a second set of eyes to have more information outside of these two formal ultrasound exams. Um, our approach is that, you know, we believe that uh, helping the patient be more engaged and the provider be more confident in monitoring the patient's health um, can really bring together this data intersection of imaging and patient data to achieve better outcomes. We think this is a really you know, positive and powerful economic proposition, and it's also powerful for the patients who have more information about their own health. Um, in terms of challenges, uh, we've noticed that it can be a challenge to introduce an innovative data-driven solution in a field where we're still relying on technology and methods that are in some cases decades old. Um, but we believe that at scale, this emphasis on data during pregnancy um, from start all the way through recovery can really help to reduce um, health disparities, um, negative in outcomes, as well as reduce costs for the system. So um, as you can tell, we're very passionate about this. Um, I specifically am. Um, and if you have any questions or want to talk more, um, please feel free to reach out to me anytime at imaginesolutionstech.com. So I'd like to open it up for further questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. It seems like your words have resonated with people because I can see in the comments, they're asking, please provide contact and website details for your program. I'll make sure that we add that to our report as we uh, release the report uh, after each of these conferences. I can see that we have some questions here. I have a question for Dr. Kukova because uh, it's been on my mind uh, from the moment I listened to you. Dr. Kukova, I, I, I have a question. Which comes first the chicken or the egg when it comes to investing in women because there is the issue of women not being able to raise enough investment but then women are not investing enough and uh, when it comes to um, femtech i think a lot of it is driven by passion it's like someone had a problem but this whole movement came out of a breakup for me because i felt like you know i had to choose between uh, career and and um, you know uh, family so uh, and I think that a lot of women face those issues right so so but when it comes to uh, technologies that are um, uh, out there for you know the general public for men not things that are not female only issues most of the time um, it, you know it, somebody has had a pain has had an, a personal issue and then has gone out and raised money and uh, tried to build a business you think about virgin for example but for some reason it seems like women are less successful at doing that so i want to hear from you which comes first is it is it the chicken or the egg um, do we need more women to gain to investment or do we need more women to try and raise investor how can we break that cycle First of all, the answer is yes to both, right? Um, we want to, you know, I think you need it from all sides. Um, let me uh, kind of uh, parse this out. With respect to investment, we, you know, Golden Seeds, for example, was started about 15 years ago because there was such a dearth of investment in women, especially early stage companies. And so they've been on the forefront of that. And that was one of the things that attracted me to um, investing. One of the things, and you would think that that's a 100% women 
investors. It's not. We have 25% of our investors are men. So these are individuals in general who either have wanted to promote women um, entrepreneurs, and they also recognize, as I talked about earlier, the um, uh, you know the the business sense of doing that because those companies are are, are more successful. What we've done also that I really have enjoyed, because I didn't come to Gold Seeds with a lot of investment experience, is have a knowledge institute and to help in people, to help our investors understand how to invest and how to understand about angel investing and learn more about it so that they can be more savvy investors. And I do think that that's a real opportunity. Um, as you said, a lot of people invest in things that because they understand the issue or they have a personal connection, but you also wanna be smart about it. So you wanna also, again, um, learn. And I think that especially early stage investing doesn't take a lot of upfront investing. You can go early stage and it's a great way for you know um, women to, to stick their toe in the water and also learn a new skill, to be real honest with you, or to use their expertise. I mean, I'm able to use my expertise along with some of my colleagues um, on looking at these healthcare deals, for example. We also need more women entrepreneurs, which means that we need more women, you know, again, uh, taking these chances and being supported. And that's another thing that we do in terms of getting them connected to the ecosystem. So all investors can use that to do that. Um, and, uh, and also to, um, uh, as I said before, we need to get more scientists, um, more savvy about how they can bring their um, evidence-based information to the market and protect that um, information, that IP. Absolutely. Very, um, very interesting. I, I, I can't wait to really dive deeper um, about this because there's so much that we can uncover and I really hope that we can help more women. So I want to um, talk to Helen here. I have a question for you, Helen. Um, can you share your experience about um, as a female entrepreneur who has built, who, who is building um, a really uh, very, very exciting, I think, um, business model that you've come up with here. Um, and I know that your focus is very much on female athletes, but uh, I do believe that it has a huge relevance also to other women who want to perform at their peak. Um, can you share your experience a little bit about um, how you came up with your, with your niche, why that female athlete and uh, any kind of... Um, uh, advice you might have for women watching this and thinking, you know what, I want to go out and build a technology business. Yeah. So first, uh, you use a word that is often used, which is a niche, and it's not. Uh, women are like it's a pretty big part of the population, and women who are doing sports is also a huge part of the population. So like there is a, a wrong belief that women who are active and do sports actually is a minority, but if you go in a gym or in yoga rooms or just in the street, in the park, uh, women are doing sports, they're playing sports, they're watching sports. Um, so it's, it's actually a wrong belief that women do not participate in sports. Um, all kids, all female kids participate in sports. Um, so so that's, that's the very first thing. The second thing is like it's such a huge opportunity. Like we are really in the dark ages of understanding and knowledge on what is a female body and what is what the, the female body is capable of. So it's a thing like in the like in the 10 coming 10 years like we've seen like the different people you have on this panel working on different areas like it's such dark ages like we have no understanding whatsoever on the female body so it's extremely uh, exciting and if you are an entrepreneur looking at going into that world or investors like if you if you think that like you know we know a lot about the male body but we know nothing so if you're investing time or money in that field um the returns are going to be massive uh, much more exciting than anything that we know on the on the male body because there's so much to augment. So yeah, it's it's very exciting, very interesting. There's more and more uh, money and interest. And some people realize that there's such a huge gap. Uh, and when there's a gap, there's money. So it's not cute or being just like doing good thing for diversity, it's just like very good money on your investment. So good place. Yeah, definitely. And and that's very interesting that you've picked up on that, right? What I said about the niche, because uh, it goes to show that even if somebody like me putting together this uh, whole conference still uses that term, um, you know, but, but what I was talking about for me, even when yeah. you talk about 
um, I, I didn't mean necessarily the female athletes. I meant the athletes. You know, what, what I guess what I'm trying to say here is that there are many women who are not athletes and there are many people who are not athletes mm. who could be using these technologies. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what yeah. It's hard because like it's a, basically you have three worlds where you have a lot of data. One is uh, the medical world where you have sick people. The other one is the army, and the third one is sports. So if when people do sports, they often track data with like wearables, Garmin, Fitbits, activities, whatever app they use, Nike Plus or whatever app. So it's a really really interesting place where you have data sets where people are willing to listen to your recommendations, improve themselves. And the nice thing is that is there is a very short loop of reward system. So if they change the behavior the nutrition, the training, very quickly they have the rewards as opposed to, for instance, if you take a diet, if you are like, you know, if you are trying to lose a lot of weight and you have a cookie and you don't need that cookie, you're not going to see the impact on that. Uh, whereas in sports, you can see and measure with data. So it's quantified um, in a quantitative manner and qualitative manner as well. So it is, it is a very nice place to start. And we are eventually down the line, a health company. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're starting with sports because there's a that's very nice loop of reward system. Definitely. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, um, so just um, we don't have a lot of time because we need to get the next group in. Um, so um, my friends in the next group, if you are listening to this, uh, you can start heading over to this link. Uh, in the meantime, just before we close, um, uh, Rick, do you want to say a few words about um, what kind of echoing, because uh, what, what Helen said is it sounds very much like what you're dealing with, with NeuroCore and why you started with the, the athletes. And then uh, I will definitely um, do a full on interview with, with you guys and we can um, dig deeper. And uh, with that in mind, I, let, I will let Rick um, say his remarks and then thank you so much for my first group. Thank you for your patience. Uh, as always, there were some glitches with uh, technology. This, this seems to be happening all the time, uh, not just with us. And, and I give so many talks and it seems like we haven't got the hang of this live stream uh, quite uh, yet. But uh, thank you for your patience. And I look forward to catching up with you over podcast. Uh, so uh, Rick, just mention uh, a few words about what you want to say. I mean, c certainly sports. We, we see a big crossover between sports and health, uh, essentially. You know, a healthy person is is uh, you know is desirable in sport. Sport people necessarily aren't the healthiest, but you know, from all the speakers tonight, I think there's a crossover of data uh, around female health challenges that are interesting from our perspective, at least. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of interlinking here. And I think that you know, aside from the fact that there's a, an opportunity and there's gap and there's uh, you know plenty of uh, good to be done. Uh, the fact that uh, you know so much of what's been said tonight is in a, in alignment. Thank That's you so helpful. much. That's uh, very helpful, Rick. And I um, look forward to catching up with you on that uh, more. I think the three of us should definitely have uh, because I think like we've got quite a lot going on here. Uh, that is, uh, yeah, we can we can have a good conversation. But with that, I'm going to say goodbye to you guys so that the next group can come in. Thank you for your time tonight, and I'll speak to you soon. All right. Thank you, Thank you guys. This was the, fir uh, uh, the first part of our conference. So now I'm going to bring in the second group. So we are all uh, learning together. And there, there are many things that uh, I didn't know and I've been learning uh, throughout these uh, uh, conferences. And as you see, the, some of our biases are so um, ingrained in our uh, brains that it, it's really difficult to shake them off. And, and it, sometimes even somebody like myself you know, trying to build a movement like this around diversity, around being able to um, give a voice to everybody. I still make mistakes. I still don't know have the answer. I don't have the answer to many things. It's one of the things that our first guest in, um, in this part of the conference is going to hopefully give us uh, some feedback on. Um, so uh, we're going to first talk to Yona Welker. So we're going to first talk to Yona. So, Yona, I have a question. See, when I started this movement, like I said in the first part, I don't know if you were listening, a lot of people were telling me, oh, you are not uh, having uh, enough diversity. You're not having people, you know, uh, from uh, various backgrounds. And, and I was like, okay, look, 
I have ADHD. As you could tell, you know, I'm always very much hyper in the beginning of, you know, every conference and, you know, then I calm down. So from a neurodiversity point of view, uh, I come from a Middle Eastern background, you know, like that's already a few, uh, it takes a few boxes in diversity. As much as we are talking about the fact that we shouldn't think about uh, diversity in a tick box exercise, sometimes it feels like that's what our audiences are asking for. Now, you have a very interesting background. You identify as a non-binary person. How do you, and please forgive me if I don't know, but maybe the fact that I don't know is a good thing because then we can talk about this and, and you know, uh, address this. For example, if somebody, uh, if I want to mention somebody's daughter or son, what is the other word if we don't want to necessarily uh, refer to their, uh, their gender? So I'm going to put you in the solo uh, layout here so you can uh, talk about this and hopefully enlighten me and our viewers and then also talk about things that we were talking about during the um, rehearsal about how we can use AI and robotics uh, and neurotechnology to address uh, personalized solutions for women in health and for people of you know all backgrounds. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, first of all, it's not really important for me how you pronounce or, or present myself, but I'm more, much more uh, for me important how what kind of ecosystem we create and that's what I would love to discuss. Uh, definitely, unfortunately, gender-focused products which actually work, which actually serve uh, narrow, diverse people or uh, minorities or particular uh, social groups are still really uh, underrepresented. And I believe it can be solved only through the joint efforts of the research, technology, venture capital, and corporate worlds. Uh, typically, this vertical includes at least five or six level of engagement. Uh, me and my colleagues try to uh, bring through different kinds of involvements. But over today's conversation, I would love to mention at least uh, three of them. And one of them is a representation in data science and AI teams. In the same way how we're not able to create a um, solution for artistic people without autism um, people in teams, in technology teams, in product teams, in design, in AI teams. In the same way, we're not able to create a, a women-focused AI uh, if we have just only 10% of women in AI in data science. Hopefully, we have a, our colleagues and allies from Women AI in France or Teen in AI in UK. I spend hackathons in the Middle East and Asia. We try to involve young people starting from schools, universities, in order to bring very simple message. In order to create technologies focused on particular groups, we need your representation in technology. You should create this technology. You should create UX and UI and user research in order to create highly niche solutions for particular challenges and problems. Second level uh, is a gender of focused neurodiverse solutions. Um, is a part of 500 startups. Uh, we've done a significant work in order to shift from holistic approach to venture capital investments when we primarily focus on different stuff just in order to make money uh, to much more focused uh, approach when we, for instance, launch uh, funds focused on particular problem, like an autism-focused venture fund would exclusively invest in autism-focused startups. But at the same time, most of the solution are uh, primarily focused on male. If we're talking about neurodiverse hiring uh, for technical uh, positions or well-being, it's uh, mostly focused on autism of male uh, type, of male spectrum. At the same time, there are evidence of differences of autism, of neurodiversity for different types of genders uh, or social groups. And finally, uh, is a collaborative AI in data. If we're talking about neurodiversity and well-being based uh, gender solutions, in most cases, we need a significant amount of data sets in cases in order to teach machine learning to make correct analysis and conclusions. For instance, just recently, we believe that the key reason behind most of a type of a depression, major depression uh, uh, syndrome, uh, is a serotonin. But nowadays, we know with also NMDA and, and, uh, and dopamine neurotransmitters are involved as well. So we need more cases, more data, and we need open source platforms focus on narrow economic visualization, open diversity statistics, brain and neural, neural neurology data, 
and mental health and psychology data. Uh, currently, uh, these platforms are primarily driven by academia, universities, uh, independent researchers, but we are really welcome corporate world, businesses to be involved in this journey. And I believe uh, this talk and this conversation and meeting uh, is another opportunity to involve you in this discussion and work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was very helpful. Thanks for your um, open mindedness and uh, for your kind uh, response, because sometimes people can get uh, a little sensitive about these things. But, you know, um, you have to remember, guys, that the world is evolving so fast. It's quite hard to sometimes to keep up with, with um, all of this. So I don't often talk about my ADHD, you know, like uh, sometimes people expect the, uh, other people to read your mind, to know, you know, like you were talking about autism, you know, the, all, the, all the different spectrums that people are, um, are experiencing. And it's only recently that we feel more comfortable talking about these things. So I'm glad uh, that we can have a uh, open-minded conversation. Very interesting, Yona, and I'm sure that we will have a very good chat over a long podcast properly. Um, so our next guest is uh, Ibelola uh, Amao. What Yona talked about here with regards to using these technologies um, to promote uh, diversity, neurodiversity, all, all various uh, sorts of diversity. None of that can happen without having more women in STEM. And that's where Ibelola comes in here. Because that's what her focus is. She is an executive consultant at Lona Deck Global Services. She is a multi award winning, uh, which is a multi, multi award winning uh, female led company. And she has won awards, uh, some very interesting, very good awards as well. She's a STEM focused value creator. Um, and uh, she has a global network. She has been recognized by Forbes. And I will let her explain uh, a little bit more herself about the work that she's doing to bring more women into STEM. Fantastic, thank you so much for having me. According to the US-based Society of Women Engineers, 13% engineers in the workforce are women. Over 32% of women switch out of STEM degree programs in college. And only 30% of women who earn bachelor's degrees in engineering are still working in engineering 20 years later. 0.4% of the executives in STEM fields are female. And statistics don't exist in Africa, but we know that there's an estimate of eight to 10% women in engineering in Africa and in STEM as well. So what we've been trying to do over the years is to identify, develop and engage girls in STEM and translate them not only into executives and leaders in STEM-based fields, but also women in entrepreneurship, because we have less than 5% of the women of CEOs running enterprises in the energy, power, infrastructure, oil and gas industries as women. So what we are trying to do at the moment and what we're doing is democratizing technology, basically to connect people, technology and innovations and get more girls into STEM leveraging the sustainable development goals and the technologies that are available. So in the area of medical tech, telehealth, mobile health, and smart healthcare, we're working on developing with IBM LinkedIn, with Microsoft LinkedIn and GitHub, data analysts, IT administrators, cloud engineering, robotics experts, graphic designers, and digital marketers. So on the free IB, uh, the free Microsoft, LinkedIn, and GitHub solutions, we're developing women and girls in STEM. So the empowerment of women would accelerate the eradication of poverty, protect the planet, improve health, socioeconomic climate actions, and ensure that more people enjoy peace and prosperity. These are part of the sustainable development goals. So what we are doing at the moment is working with 50 SDG focused STEM and tech female ambassadors in Nigeria, Ghana, Tanzania, Uganda, and Malawi. And we're connecting women in technology and innovation to accelerate the sustainable development goals 
seven, eight, nine, and 11, building a digital ecosystem to improve connectivity from grassroots to the global supply chain, digitally upskilling and empowering young girls and women in STEM and entrepreneurship. And we have 50 fantastic female STEMpreneurs and techpreneurs to democratize technology for OEMs. At the moment, we're about to partner with people like yourselves to scale up and ensure that in each of the five countries, we have a hundred STEM ambassadors. And this will involve us replicating through a train the trainer program, the empowerment of women and girls on the Microsoft, LinkedIn and GitHub solution to address skills gaps and foster collaboration between STEM talent in Africa and the West and the global economies, digital economies, apart from the engineering technology and innovation solutions, we offer OEMs and proprietors of technologies, skilled STEMpreneurs, techpreneurs, coders, data analysts, and scientists. So we'll be happy to speak to you about any of these skilled resources so that we can collaborate to increase the women and girls in the STEM field. Thank you so much. That was so inspiring, the work that you're doing, trying to bring in more women into STEM. But of course, it all starts from a young age. If you want to have more, um, you know, more female um, engineers, coders, um, entrepreneurs, however you look at it, you know, we need to start from an early age and change the mindset of young girls. So I'm going to bring in our next guest, who is Holly Cinder. Holly is the chief marketing officer of another very good uh, female-led um, consulting firm. It's called All Women Leadership Strategies. Uh, Holly's background is in marketing, obviously, and very much like myself. And what something that people in marketing understand pretty well is that it all comes down to storytelling. So if you want to have more women in STEM, you need to be able to tell a story to encourage more women to, uh, you know, to come into uh, the field. So uh, I'm fascinated by this, by this concept of how we can use storytelling to encourage more women to get into technology and business. So I will let Oli share her experience with you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's great to be with all of you today. Um, like Tommy said, I've spent my career in branding and marketing. Um, and when I co-founded All Women Leadership, uh, the goal was to develop strategic communications strategies that would help our clients connect with their audience change to accelerate technology adoption. And so, you know, throughout these two panels, many of the, my co-panelists have been sharing uh, the issues that are facing femtech, and I think in the last panel clearly articulated the chicken and the egg problem. We know that women are half of the world's population, um, but are underrepresented in the STEM fields and underpaid, underfunded in business. Um, and so if we want to close that gap and create a more equitable future, we really need to give people a reason to change which in short means that femtech has a marketing problem. Um, and by that, I mean a marketing problem at the core of marketing, which is the creation for, of demand for products and services. So how do we go about creating demand for femtech? Um, like every marketing problem, it's going to be solved through storytelling. Um, stories are what creates connection and build credibility uh, when they're delivered to the right people in the right place at the right time. And luckily, each and every one of us has the opportunity to start where we are and create that demand for femtech innovation. Um, the first thing that you need to do in your storytelling is to be clear on who your audience and stakeholders are. You can't craft stories that resonate if you're not clear on who you're trying to connect with. Um, and the second step is to really understand those people on a deeper level. We can't just look at demographics or, you know, tick those diversity boxes. We have to look a little bit deeper. We have to segment our audiences by psychographics and really ask the question why to understand them. 
And then you craft your story in a way that connects their why with your technology. And your objective is to walk them from point A to point B and build trust. Um, a recent Salesforce study found that 82% of consumers think that trustworthiness matters more today than it did a year ago. And building that trust will help you win hearts and change minds for your initiative. Uh, the fourth key is consistency. Um, people really need to hear a message an average of seven times before it sinks in. And that figure honestly shocked me when I first heard it. Uh, seven seemed like it would be very repetitive. Um, but according to McKinsey research, people who tell a consistent story are four times more likely for their technology rollout to succeed. And then the last thing in storytelling is don't forget to celebrate success. Your success stories will help your initiative take root and grow, and it will spur others to get involved and build on what you've accomplished. Um, and if I can take a few minutes to give you a real world example from the fashion industry, um, one company that's done this really well and really turned an industry on its head is Rent the Runway. Founders were told by fashion industry leaders that women just simply would not rent clothing. Um, that, you know, that was a men thing. They'd rent tuxes for weddings, but women absolutely wanted to own their clothing. Um, and instead of giving up, the founders opened up a pop-up on their campus to test their theory. And what they did is they gathered stories from the women who stopped in, who would rent clothes, and they made that emotional connection through stories and took them back to the industry and they refined their storytelling and their pitches through many rejections until they found people who would take a chance on change. And ultimately they created a multi-billion dollar business and flipped the industry on its head with a brand new business model. And I think the opportunity to do the same in femtech is here. So my challenge to all of you is to start today and hone your story, test your message with someone new, and use that feedback to reinvigorate your efforts to drive innovation and change. Thank you so much. Let's bring uh, Stacey. So, so Stacey is a, a communication strategist. So she is disrupting the way that mainstream agency uh, mentality is set up, and, and she's looking at um, holistic ad advertising mechanisms to help her clients become and remain leaders in their industries. She's really passionate about getting young girls, changing the mentality, bringing more uh, young girls into bringing them into these, these fields, you know, from science, technology. And she has also won a, a number of awards. I will let you explain, Stacey, yourself, because I can see that you've got quite a few awards here. So uh, I'll let you explain. <laughs> Well, the awards aren't what I'm focusing on today. What I'm focusing on today is my experience as a communications director of the CHIO Research Institute, which is a pediatric uh, research center. Okay, awesome. Yes. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, like all things, when it comes to careers, you can't be what you don't see. And if the task of communicating technology and research careers to young women and girls of tomorrow well, that means doing it where their attention lives, using mediums that they want to consume. And now is the best time to do it. Why? Because right now, the entire human race is watching researchers working on a vaccine that will impact our immediate future. In other words, research has never been so sexy. So how do we do this? Well, first, we need to understand that disseminating research to young women and girls cannot be done the same way we share research findings within the scientific and medical community. Having a research paper, having research public in a high impact journal is great, but a young person, even one who has a keen interest in medical research, should not be expected to review publications to find the takeaways. Traditional broadcast media would break down these publications into layman's stories, but they only choose newsworthy stories, and more importantly, broadcast media is not where young people's attention is. So, how do we get their attention? How do we translate the information into t relatable takeaways? And what mediums do we use to present it? First, let's tackle how we get their attention. We need to find areas of interest within research that spark curiosity for young people. That could be methods of research that are seen as cool. For example, at SHIO, when we do tours of our wet labs, we often have people participate in extracting DNA from a strawberry. Each person is given the tools they need and hands-on instructions. 
That experience is so powerful that we don't only have youth asking for us, it's among one of the favorites of our C-suite tours as well. Other labs use zebrafish to conduct cancer research. Yes, zebrafish, the $2 fish that you get in the pet store. Um, kids who experience and understand the possibilities research holds for them from an everyday life, um, it creates a connection that will inspire curiosity. And curiosity, by the way, is one of our core values at Shia Research for that good reason. So how do we translate this information into relatable takeaways? Not every research methodology uses cool visuals. So how do we connect? We do it by focusing on the hope that research brings and the outcomes that will follow. We need to make it personal. Knowing that your friend on the playground has type 1 diabetes and the insulin pump that they use wasn't even invented when grandma and grandpa were born. It could be sharing that researchers are working on ways to make cancer treatments not so hard on the body so that your teacher will be able to come back to the class soon. We need to speak to youth to personalize the discoveries in a way to create a strong sense of empathy towards the research. So that leaves us with how to present the research. It's our responsibility as a scientific and medical communications professionals to create strategies for digital dissemination focused on finding what these mean to people. My team at Chio Research created a series called Discovery Minutes, which simply asks, what was the question you were asking and what did you learn? Other organization, organizations are creating animation and explainer videos and even podcasts. We need to remember that it's up to us to clearly lay out the connection that research can bring to young people's lives. It's not the audience's responsibility to seek out the information and break it down and apply it to their lives. Thank you so much, Stacey. That was so uh, interesting. I really wish that that was how they taught science when I went to school. You know, and I, and I can see the value of documenting those and sharing it with young people you know that's the sort of thing that should be on TikTok, you know and, and you know on, on youtube instagram you know that when i go to these social media i always think like they're not you know, we don't have the right kind of content on there i know i only started a year ago so you got to give me some time it's uh research and academic work uh, research and academics tend to be uh large moving ships that are a little hard to turn but uh my organization is on board, so I'm excited to see where it's going to go. Yeah, you're doing amazing work. I'm, I'm really excited, and I definitely want to talk to you about it more in a podcast. Okay, we talked quite a bit about science and technology that's behind our, uh, women's health issues. That's like the things that are behind these. So now with our next guest, we're going to kind of go dive back into some of the uh, kind of hands-on. These are people who are working with women uh, on their health issues uh, in a in a more hands-on way. And, and Professor Cynthia LaRouge, she specializes in the study of health information systems, particularly in the area of telemedicine and consumer health informatics. Her work is, give, uh, is giving patients a voice through data that has led um, to the development of an electronic patient reported outcome toolkit, uh, which is freely available online. And she's going to share her experience and observation around prenatal anxiety and its impact on the quality of life for mothers. So most importantly, um, she's going to tell us about how we can leverage technology to address these, uh, uh, these prenatal anxiety uh, matters. And it's something that Honestly, I didn't know much about it. Was uh, it was fascinating listening to Professor LaRouge uh, during the um, rehearsals because I thought, you know, there's so much we, we think because because we are women that we know a lot of issues around women's health. But actually, you know, I've never had a kid and I uh, I didn't know about this. So I will let her explain to you that. Thank you so much for that introduction. Many people have heard of postpartum depression but far fewer have heard of perinatal anxiety. The implications of anxiety are huge on women's work life, family life, and their relationships. And there are additional health implications for not only the woman, but also for her child. In fact, half of pregnant women who experience anxiety are never diagnosed. Anxiety can occur at any time during pregnancy and it may not go away after childbirth. So what does the care situation look like? Pregnant women may not understand that what they experience is a treatable condition and not just normal. Even when they experience the effects of anxious thoughts, actions, feelings, and body sensations, women may not seek to sustain care due to societal stigmas around mental health care, pregnant means happy, or pharmaceutical misconceptions. 
OBs and midwives are hampered by limited training regarding anxiety and really a lot of social cycle issues, as well as limited resources to refer these women to. Perinatal anxiety can be more pronounced during these times of COVID and for minority populations. So where does technology fit? I've been working with multiple consumer health informatics, academic industry efforts that leverage multidisciplinary teams to consider the research issues and concerns around issues like perinatal anxiety and discern ways that technology can one, help to empower patients and two, support health systems receive evidence-based patient-generated health data. This data can facilitate patient-provider communication, track patient progress, and build databases of feedback from a cadre of women on the outcomes of various types of interventions to find the right ones that work with each woman. For example, in the case of perinatal anxiety, increasing use of electronic patient reported outcomes or ePROs can help. They can help by collecting responses to research validated questionnaires from women at the start and during the course of their pregnancy identify individual trends for each woman, and also identify trends and compare groups of women to learn more about this condition and what can help. We've developed, has indicated, an online freely available EPRO toolkit that contains guidelines and resources to assist health systems implement EPROs for many health conditions across the entire health network. In addition, in the case of perinatal anxiety, there are multiple care decisions to be made. Increasing the development, evaluation, and use of electronic patient decision aids that can educate patients on options for conditions like perinatal anxiety and many others, and document these preferences and choices for the women in the EHR can help to support treatment plans that are not forgotten and are in everybody's comfort zone. Also, in our specific work on perinatal anxiety, women mentioned the possibilities of innovative forms of telemedicine that meet them where they are. For example, like evidence-based chatbots that the women can access at night when they may be facing anxiety alone. The design of all of these forms of consumer-facing tools have to reflect inclusion so that a spectrum of women can see themselves in using the tools and resources that are developed. Perinatal anxiety is a real issue and FemTech can help. In fact, this is just one of many female health issues ripe for femtech tools to help empower women in their health care. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor LaRouge. That, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this was something that um, I didn't really know much about until we had the discussion. Um, but uh, our next guest is going to talk about a topic that I think has probably passed the minds of pretty much every woman, and that is breast cancer, because we hear quite a lot about it. But what's fascinating from what I learned uh, from Andrea, um, who, uh, Andrea Wolf, our next speaker, who is going to explain a little bit more about it now, is that although we've heard so much about it, we actually don't know enough about it. And, and, it, and it's the thing that really just this disconnect, you know, you think because it's on the news a lot that you know about it, but actually most of us don't. Um, so Andrea is the CEO of Brem Foundation for, uh, to defeat breast cancer. Her experience with public policy, marketing, communication, and partnerships has led to a great progress in the early detection of breast cancer. And she's going to share her observation with us regarding lack of sufficient data regarding breast cancer. Um, first of all, thank you so much. I'm honored to be here on this illustrious panel. It's been really informative for me, as I'm sure it is for everybody else. So um, thank you for including me. Uh, you are right. Um, breast cancer is something that we hear about all over the place, right? We see the pink ribbon on billboards. You can't open the newspaper and not see breast cancer. It's on the sides of trucks, on TV. I think until COVID, breast cancer may have been the most well-publicized uh, diseases in the United States and possibly even in the world. Um, and yet with all this recognition and all the discussion about walks and research, um, women and men, frankly, uh, are not getting the information that they really need to maximize their chances of finding that early curable breast cancer. Now, before I tell you what you do need, let me tell you why that matters. It matters because breast cancer is over 95% curable when caught in its earliest stages, but only about 22% at its latest stages. 
So the difference between knowing what you need and not can mean the difference between life and death. So what do we do? First and foremost, every, every woman needs to find out her personal risk factors and correlate them with her screening options. What do you mean personalized screening? A lot of times because of all the publicity, people think that a mammogram is enough. But we live in an era where everything is personalized, right? Our Facebook pages, our phone cases, our salads. And yet when it comes to breast cancer, people seem to be okay with the same screening for everybody. And it's just so not true. So every woman and every man who might love a woman um, should learn about what those risk factors are, whether they are just being a woman, um, dense breast tissue, family history, genetics, lifestyle, all of that um, correlates to a particular screening regimen that needs to be um, optimized for your risk factors. Um, now you might say, how do I do that if I'm not getting the information I need from the media and from the general ecosystem? You need to find reliable resources like the Brem Foundation that can help you figure out what it is that you need. Um, the Brem Foundation has a comprehensive digital library and free events and resources, and we're not the only ones out there, and I'd be more than happy to help direct anybody on the call um, to, how to, to learn how to figure that out. The other thing that's really important is that you can't rely on general knowledge on what you're hearing out there um, and, and use that as your formulation for your healthcare. Why is that? This is, is because there's a lot of confusing information. Right? We hear all the time about different guidelines, for example, of when you need a mammogram. Um, and those different guidelines don't tell you the whole story. So for example, any uh, recommendation that's anything other than starting at age 40 every year uh, reduces, uh, increases mortality rate by at least 19%. Now, I can pretty well guess that nobody wants to be in that category of the 19% mortality rate that goes up when you don't screen properly. So make sure that you not only get accurate information from accurate resources, but also that you're a self-advocate, that you know what you're entitled to, that you know that there are screenings out there beyond mammograms. There's ultrasound, there's MRI, there's molecular breast imaging. The technologies are much more vast and much more essential than we realize. And finally, um, and I think pretty appropriately given the panelists on this uh, conference, is to think outside the box and support innovative advancements. Um, and I think this is important for two, in two ways. The first is uh, to think about women in underserved communities who might not have access to the resources that others do to get properly screened. Um, and there are entities out there, including the Brem Foundation, that are innovating ways to increase access. For example, um, we teamed up with Lyft to create the country's, the United States, uh, the first and only cost-free ride-sharing program in the United States that's exclusively dedicated to breast care. This program has exploded and is helping women of color and immigrants primarily so that transportation, for example, is not a barrier to care. And second, um, there are innovations in screening technologies where women entrepreneurs should invest because the more that we can uh, understand how telemedicine and changes because of COVID are gonna impact breast care, the more lives we can save. Thank you so much. And I'd be happy to connect with anybody uh, after this who'd like to talk more. Uh, thank you so much, um, Andrea. Uh, that was very eye-opening and I'm sure that our uh, audience here agrees. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking to you more about it. So um, now, of course, you know, we talked about women's health issues quite a lot. Most of the time, these are, when we talk about women's health, we are, most of the world, kind of trying to look at problems that uh, need solving, right? So like it's a pain or it's something that we need to improve. But one area that is really neglected and we don't talk about openly is uh, women's sexual, um, sexual health, sexual pleasure. And it's something that, you know, it's been a little bit of a neglected um, taboo uh, to uh, to talk about. And our next guest, uh, Jackie Rotman, um, is somebody who has done very interesting work on this. Uh, when we talked about these things in the rehearsal, I thought that, you know, it, I'd really like to end this conversation, uh, the, this panel with, with Jackie's remarks, because I feel like we are going to um, 
do it on a high in a way, you know, we are looking at something that's, you know, we are looking at how can we give more value and more, um, you know, we can, how can we actually invest in businesses that are going to focus on female pleasure and sexual health? Jackie has done some, uh, has, has been working on in this area since she was uh, 14. She's been very active and she has founded an organization that uses the history of hip hop uh, to um, close the opportunity gap for youth, for the youth in, in the US. She has also led um, Spark, which is a philanthropic network which is dedicated to women's and girls empowerment and uh, she's going to talk about um, how advertising world the advertising world the, uh, and the corporate policies are blocking women's sexual health innovation and how we can change this she's now the ceo of the uh, the center for intimacy justice which i love that name it's such a uh, just I, I just thought it was a beautiful name so jackie um tell us what you've got to say yeah. Thank you so much, Somi, for your beautiful words. Technology plays a powerful role in determining who is entitled to what experience, including in the most intimate areas of our lives. Today, Facebook is making choices that stunt entire markets for women, femme, and non-binary individuals. Facebook is currently the most important advertising engine for businesses to grow, reach customers, and for those businesses that want to raise venture capital financing to reach the growth curves necessary for that. It's also more affordable for startups compared to Google's pricing model, and it allows for highly targeting data. So it's a crucial tool for entrepreneurs. And yet on a daily basis today, Facebook is systematically banning ads for menopause, endometriosis, vaginismus, and female pleasure. Whether these ads are by startups or even by educational nonprofits. Ads like women going for a jog with encouragement to talk to her doctor about menopause symptoms, Facebook is currently banning as adult products, considering them inappropriate or obscene. And yet Facebook is allowing mass advertisements for erectile dysfunction, a choice Facebook made that has allowed two erectile dysfunction startups founded in 2017 to be valued at over a billion dollars today each. What about the companies for women's health that could have become unicorns in that time, including those led by female founders that Facebook's policies are stunting and preventing? Facebook's policies are despite the fact that women's sexual health and wellness, like menopause, endometriosis, and female pleasure, make up massive multi-billion dollar markets, much larger than erectile dysfunction, with so much opportunity for economic development and creation. Billions of women would benefit from more tools and information about our intimate lives. Nearly three out of four women experience painful intercourse at some point. One in four women said that their last sexual encounter was physically painful. Half of women ages 18 to 35 have trouble reaching orgasm with a partner. And for those women, half of women who say that they brought up sexual function concerns with their doctor say that their doctor expressed reluctance to treat them. Creating equal business rules toward women's sexual health companies matters not just for sexual health outcomes, it matters for our culture. For so many women and people across the gender spectrum, sexuality is often experienced as a source of trauma and victimization for countless many people. We need narratives of women having agency over our bodies. We need narratives of healthy sexuality. When we live in a world in which half our population is inundated with ads about penises, with cis men being targeted starting in their 20s, with erectile dysfunction ads, and yet the rest of us have our sexual well being silenced, we're in a world that needs healing and rebalancing. Changing internal corporate policies toward women's sexual health and wellness companies is one expression and one impactful driver of that change, one that my organization, Center for Intimacy Justice, is working to create and invites you to be a part of. That broader rebalancing can be liberating 
not only for women, not only for femme or non-binary people, but for all of us. I thought that that was a very uh, powerful note to end on. Um, and I want to bring back Yona here to ask him a question because I know, Yona, you have done work with uh, a lot of um, tech startups, tech, tech corporations um, in Silicon Valley, and you know, you've, you've been very active. So um, what is your experience regarding these advertising policies and how we can, um, we can change this narrative? Um, what, are your, what are some of your input uh, around this topic? First of all, it's actually related to the first point I mentioned uh, in my uh, speech is related to uh, representation uh, in teams. Unfortunately, it's almost impossible to drive any kind of internal corporate policies if you have no presence of particular type of people. So in order to drive inclusive technology in Microsoft for people with visual impairment or hearing impairment, Microsoft actually... Int uh, um, hire more people with disabilities to technology teams, to uh, inclusive teams, in order to actually drive policies and algorithms behind their decisions. So uh, I believe uh, Facebook is still a bit uh, behind uh, such unicorns like uh, uh, Google and Microsoft who lead the game in terms of uh, inclusive uh, policies. Uh, it's a first thing. And second thing uh, is the ethics of data and AI in general and is a part of my work as well. I'm working uh, on um, data ethics in the US, Canada, in uh, Europe as well. And uh, we should... Uh, provide uh, corporates and specific technology unicorns with some kind of a um, rules of games, uh, how we should act. And what what you just share, uh, described, it's not actually a fair game. Uh, it's about using advertisement and the way how you see it, uh, but not how you actually um, treat fairly your customers, people who actually uh, made you billionaires and build your, um, make you unicorn. So yes, it, it is a combination of representation uh, and better policies from government and public thank, organizations. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Yana. I want to bring back uh, Stacy and um, Holly here because uh, you guys both come from that marketing and, and advertising and, and you know the storytelling background. I wonder what is the way. Um, to change, you know, from your perspective, would be interesting to hear because as somebody who comes from a marketing background myself, it was part of the reason why I put this thing together and building this platform is because I feel like the, the platforms that already exist, you see, let me, let me put it this way. The very fact that majority of these platforms uh, like Facebook, you know, the, uh, most social media platforms are built on the premise of engagement because they are uh, they're getting um, their advertising revenue through that. What's interesting is that what drives engagement is not necessarily always what's best for, for society. How do we go about changing that um, other than somehow taking that power back by building unicorns uh, you know, that have a different, so let's go, let's go with, uh, Stacy first, um, and then come back to Holly. I think it's actually more of a business decision rather than a marketing decision. I think when it comes to, um, when it comes to this, one of the key points in her, her discussion was that, um, there's more revenue in the female streams. And I think the solution for this is you got to hit them. It all comes down to money. It's all about money. So if you can prove that there's more money in female, then they will follow the money. Because um, as a marketer, it's kind of a double-edged sword. I understand what these metrics and these advertising mechanisms are doing to society, but I will be the first to admit that I use these um, that the, the data that Facebook gives me to help my clients when they hire me. So I think what really the only way to really make a change is to go after the money and prove to Facebook that there is money in these other um, avenues. And then I guess my question would be is when it comes to the erectile dysfunction, we're making the assumption that men are buying. It's possible that women are buying because on Facebook, it's skewed more highly towards women than to men. So I wonder what the back end looks like on that a little bit. Um, that would that would be rather than try to create a new or new platform to fight with Facebook, that's too much energy. My advice would be uh, hit them in the pocketbook. 
That's a, that, that's a very interesting way of uh, looking at it. Um, I, I very much doubt that the erectile dis dysfunction is being, um, you know, uh, driven. That I, I very much doubt it. It would be very interesting to look at that data, um, but I think that just looking at the dynamics of our culture, I, I very much doubt that would be the case. We can talk about this um, properly more in a uh, in a podcast conversation, but when it comes to when you're talking about, uh, you know, tell them about the money where where the money is. I mean, these are some very intelligent people. Surely they're doing their due diligence. So I, I don't know. I mean, I can't get my head around the fact that they would drop the opportunity. I mean, femtech is a huge uh, market. And when I look at even like our conversation here today, you know, and, and the level of engagement, I can see that a lot of people are looking at femtech still as a very niche area and, and they don't I don't think a lot of people quite get it so so what do you think I, I think it goes back to marketing in some ways because even if it comes to business still marketing needs to make it popular right so what do you think Holly I completely agree I mean I think it goes back to the demand creation that marketing is all about and I think to Stacy's point about show them the money um that that is the why and you have to connect the money to the um initiatives and i mean they're not going to overturn policies unless it makes some kind of financial sense right so what is that story who's the right person to tell it and then how do you get to them to tell that story that's the hard part to figure out and that's Kind of the the bigger picture that you know marketing can help solve and i think all of these um initiatives and you know femtech solutions if they tell their story correctly and we're able to aggregate it to show that it's not a niche anymore and tell that story that's when we'll start to have that impact um yeah and change definitely. policies um Okay, so um, Andrea, I'm going to bring you back in um, because uh, what's your experience been with regards to um, to breast cancer uh, when it comes to um, the advertising uh, world? It's a really, thank you, Somi. I think it's a really interesting area and one that frankly we don't have a lot of data on. Um, and that's something that actually as a as a community we can work on because you know, that is a failing. We need to better understand what, uh, what, what's going on and how it's impacting women directly. What I can tell you from my experience um, is that oftentimes women think they know everything they need to know because there is so much treatment of breast cancer in uh, whatever category awareness means about, you know, walks and um, investments in research. And yet, and there's celebrities all over the place. I mean, it unfortunately is an issue that impacts about 12% of the population and in certain demographics, much more than that. Um, and so I'm proud that, that the advertising and media world has taken this up as a cause. That said, I think we are doing a disservice to women because they're tired of it and they're not getting the information they're getting is not relevant to individually what each one needs to be able to maximize her chances of finding that early curable breast cancer. We need women to know that um, dense breast tissue is a huge risk factor affecting almost 50% of the population and very few people know about it. We need women to know that mammograms are the start, not the end of what you need to get screened and that other screening modalities are, are essential. They're not optional. These are very quick tidbits. Um, that really save lives. And we know that every day. So in terms of advertising and marketing, my wish is that um, we were much more targeted about the information that we're disseminating. Um, I'd be happy to share with you and everybody the video that the Brem Foundation created. Uh, it was an award-winning video and one that kind of really encapsulates the messages that women need to know um, to empower themselves. Let me say one other thing. I think men are our secret weapon here. We hear all the time, that women are reticent to go. They're either scared, they don't want to make the time. It's not pleasant, right? I'm not going to lie. 
But when the men who love them, whether it's fathers or sons or husbands say, you know what, honey, it's really time for your mammogram. You should go. I love you. Go. Um, it makes a big difference. So that, and then one other thing is public policy. Um, public policy plays a pivotal role in whether women are able to do this. So for example, in New York, uh, the governor enacted into law a bill that gives all public workers three hours off a year to go get their mammograms as long as they document that that's what they did. It mandates that um, breast centers stay open on weekends and after hours so that there's not this struggle, especially for lower income women to say like, I'm choosing between putting dinner on the table and getting my screening. They shouldn't have to choose. So I would say, you know, better information and public policy is, is really um, important. here. Thank you so much. That was uh, yeah, very important issues that was raised here today. And I really hope that um, you know, we've done a little bit to raise awareness about all of these. Um, I'm looking forward to jumping into proper long form podcast conversations with you guys on all of these topics. For today, I'm just going to have to bring this to an end, but I would like to hear from everybody. Um, you know, we've now had three of these conferences. I know that this three minute um, format has been very popular. People like the fact that they can hear so many different perspectives, but at the same time, I'm really enjoying these um, kind of as we have the uh, Q&A and, and jump into kind of longer form uh, conversations. So please do let me know your opinion, your preference in how you would like us to uh, continue these conversations next year. We have four big conferences coming up next year. So we're going to do one every quarter because, you know, I thought I could do one every six weeks and actually it broke my back. <laughs> you know, it's been a very, very difficult thing to do. So uh, we're going to do one every quarter. We're going to focus on quality as always, and uh, we will uh, refine our technology. As many of you guys know, the Femme Talent platform that we have right now is just a prototype. You know, we have a team now building um, the Femme Peak, which is going to be the new one. For those of you who are wondering why the change of name is because we went to a trade market and we realized that uh, there was a company in uh, Europe who had a similar name, so we couldn't use that name. So we are rebuilding the website, everything, the technology will be better. All of these glitches, all of these bugs will go away and everything will be so much better. So we are going to be fempeak.ai and uh, we have four very exciting conferences. So the first one is going to be the beginning of, so we're going to have one every quarter. The first one is going to be in the beginning of uh, March. It's uh, going to be about um, future of work. Where do women stand? Um, the second one is going to be on, it's always going to be on a uh, Wednesday. So the second one is 2nd of June and it's about, it, it's called the algorithms of sex, beauty, and aging, how technology shapes the female image and experience. The third one next year is going to be 1st of September, investment, investment in women and women in investment. So we're going to go back to um, all things financial literacy. And uh, the, the last one for next year is going to be about mental, mental and physical health technology. So kind of by the time we get to next year, around this time, we're going to come back to Femtech to see how as our community grows we um, really focus more on these topics and how we change things um, we are also going to have workshops you know we are working on um, very interesting partnerships with a number of corporations we're going to do workshops on helping more women get into technology you know careers tech tech based careers science based uh, careers and, and um, you know developing entrepreneurship skills so all of these different things one of the things that i'm really excited i really want to get more women into is cyber security you know what guys if you're listening to this and you're thinking about a change of career actually there are some very interesting uh, opportunities in cyber security and i recently uh, chaired a, a conference uh, around cybersecurity with a company called Anapsis, you know, I just it really was eye-opening. There are so many interesting opportunities for women to uh, carve careers for themselves in 
um, you know, more technical sides of technology. So I will talk about those more next year. We'll do workshops. You know, I really want to get more women into technology, into uh, science and uh, entrepreneurship, leadership, all those things that are going to hopefully change the shape of our world and change the narrative for women. Uh, with that in mind, this is the last conference of the year. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the new year. If you haven't already, make sure to fill out the form. I have sent a form in, in the email communication I've done, uh, which gives you uh, a, a, an overview of the kind of things that we are looking at for next year. So you can fill, a, fill out the form that will become the foundation of your profile. So these are the things, for example, we ask you what you're looking for, you know, what kind of opportunities, whether, for example, if you're somebody who's looking for speaking opportunities, or if you're looking for consulting opportunities, we want to be able to match you with those things. If you're looking for investment, you know, all of those things. So I will explain more about these and I will create Q and A videos and yeah, I will continue uh, this journey. And next year is going to be an amazing year and we are going to rock this place. All right, bye guys.